All right, so now we're in the inside of the vessel um, and we're about to look at the DC, before it was the DC main distribution, now we're going to look at the DC panel. So the DC distribution down there was doing a bunch of circuits that were directly connected and now here we've got a uh, DC panel. So you can see this is a DC panel that's undergone some changes. The first thing that I really like about what I'm seeing is you'll notice there's actually, yes, new labeling. It doesn't, may not look modern than the way it was originally, but at least everything is labeled. It's quite common to see boats like this where you need to almost have a translator. Oh yeah, you know, steaming light is actually my running light. Uh, my fridge is actually my inverter. My water is actually something else. And so I really like that this whole panel is actually was relabeled. I think that's really essential, especially when things get crazy on a boat, it's important to know where certain breakers are. The other thing too I'm noticing is actually even uh, the size of the breakers. You can see, you know, 15, 15 amp, 5, 5, 5, 15, 5, 5. So this is telling us um, the size of the breakers here. You can see there's actually three panels here. There's a DC panel with a battery monitor. We saw the shunt a little bit earlier. Naturally, it used to be other things here that have been removed. And this is another sub DC distribution. And this is an AC breaker. Now, on an older boat like this, um, there's no voltmeter, which if this was a new panel, you'd have to have a voltmeter. Um, and also, you, you have a reverse polarity light. That's good. Um, and so that's kind of the front of the panel. Not a too unusual. Um, you know, again, uh, the front end of the panel looks really good. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look behind the panel. And we're going to drop this down. And here we've got... I mean, this certainly isn't what a DC panel on a new, new boat would look like. So there is definitely room for improvement here. The good news, um, and let's start with the good news, is I'm seeing a lot, it looks like someone, maybe it's the owner or someone else, has over time started labeling all the wires, right? And, and yes, this cable is going to a breaker that's labeled water pressure, but now you can actually tell just from looking at the behind that actually, you know, here's we've got an alarm. And someone's taking the time to start labeling every, not every wire, but most of the wires. So that's the good news. Um, you can see basically you've got feeds coming in, right? You've got, this is basically the feed coming in, and you've got another feed coming in. What's confusing about this, as you can see, is you're, you know, on this boat, they're using black wires for DC, and then they're using red electrical tape to indicate that it's actually positive. So that's something you've got to be really careful on an older boat like this, um, that you always look for the telltale clues. If, certainly, if we were wiring this boat, we would absolutely use red for, for positive and yellow for negative. So that's the good. Uh, First thing that concerns me right away, um, and because it's a big safety factor, is the back of this AC panel does not have a cover. This is a double pole breaker. Um, if you touch any of these wires here, you could die. Like I'm an inch away from potentially dying. As simple as that. Uh, they've got a little bus protector here on top of uh, the hot that's feeding all these. Now notice actually all these cables uh, are actually red. Now that for me is a huge issue. Red is 12 volts. It's never, doesn't mean 120 hot. And here we've got red cabling actually indicating uh, 120. So that means that someone needs to actually really know what they're doing and they need to understand that this is AC and actually now we're using AC and but we're using red. And so it would not be uncommon for maybe, maybe an amateur or do it yourself to actually think this is benign, like here. Right? Everything here is 12 volts. And under, not understand that this is actually 120. And so if you touch any one of those breakers, when the, actually the breaker is on, you again can have a chance of dying. So I'm, there's, there's, I believe there's a lot of room to maneuver in a lot of things. Um, but whenever death is at play, and I'm not trying to make this a big deal out of nothing, uh, I simply think there's no excuse to have any red on any at all. Um, AC circuits, period. What's the color? It should be black. Black and white. And you'll actually notice they, this is used out of convenience, right? You've got a cable here, you know, black, white, and green. 
And what the owner did, or someone, or it could have been a do-it-yourself, it could be a mechanic, it could be a so-called electrician, probably had a big spool of red wire, wanted to, the wires were too short, right, uh, to reach this panel. And so what they use is they ended up using red uh, to extend all the wires, making back to the panel. And so that's an absolute no-no. We've got a neutral bus here, which is great. It's covered. Um, over time, it would actually be good to label those neutrals too. You've got a double pole breaker, um, which is, you need one, which is great. So this is the AC feed coming in. You've got a, a grounding bus, which is great. Well, it's, I really like that. The neutral bus, like I said, I like. Double pole, I like. Uh, but I really don't like that there's no back cover. You actually need to have a mechanical device to get access to that. You should not be able to just drop down a panel and get access to that. This side. This side you, you're fine, but AC you can't access so easily. So now that we're looking at, we've let go of the AC, um, I would look at now the DC side. And, you know, on my boat, to be honest, I had something similar when I got my boat. My boat is 27 years old. And my DC distribution wasn't like that built from the factory, but I can tell you that previous owners made it look like that. And what I did on my boat, and you see this with really new builds or bigger boats, um, what they'll do is they'll actually bring all these wires and they'll bring them to terminal strips. And so what you would do is you would bring all these wires, you take them all off the breakers, and you bring them right on the back and you install in the back here, um, a bunch of terminal strips and these terminal strips would actually terminate all those wires and then the great thing about doing that is the length of the wire is going to be long enough to reach all that back wall without using all these butt connectors everywhere these butt connectors are going to really cause a lot of grief butt connectors just cause a lot of pain over time so you take all of this and you bring them all over here on the positives on terminal strips and then you install those negative bus bars, not here, but again over here. And then what you do is you take from this terminal strips, you install and you route bundles of cables that go to this breaker and this breaker. And so what it does is it cleans. So over time, as you're adding new or taking new circuits or off, you're never actually going back to the breakers. You're always going back to the terminal strips because everything from here to there stays the same. And so what you would do is maybe you would oversize the wire so that as if you ever decided to change a 5 amp to a 15 amp, the, any cable in that bundle would be able to handle 15 amps. And so that would be a really big um, thing that I would recommend doing on this boat. And what it does is it, it allows that when you lift, open, and close this, you're not going to have a, accidental wires getting pinched, getting crushed, getting twisted. Right? Because over time what's going to happen is that might cause the panels to you know, act intermittently. You can actually see layering here. Uh, what I mean by that is you can see things that were done recently and things that are more legacy. You can tell this is a new, relatively new cable. Right? So this is a new DC uh, cable that's coming from the, the common ground bus that we saw down below. Feeds here, there's a little jumper that comes across. And then you can actually notice there's another cable over here. Um, and what you commonly see on a lot of boats, especially with grounds, and it's really essential to, you should never, grounds are like, um, grounds are like trees. A tree never grows back onto itself, right? And when you talk about electricity, you really think about, people use words like trunk and branches. And a tree, as it leaves the ground, right, goes on a trunk. The trunk might then separate into other trunks and then eventually to branches. But a branch never grows back onto itself, right? So the sap doesn't turn in, in a loop, right? It actually goes out. And there's never more than one path to a leaf. You can only go from earth to a leaf on one path only. And when you're doing grounds on the boat, people think that more is better. And what they end up doing is they end up starting to look, oh, well, I'm going to have a path to the engine. I'm going to have another path to DC ground. But then they're realizing that their engine ground is connected to the common ground. And now what they did is they did actually a current loop. Because now what they're doing is like they think more is merry. 
or merrier. So what you want to do if you're actually wiring your boat, especially on the ground, is you never, ever, ever want to have loops. It's got to be like a tree. A leaf has only one path all the way back to ground. And so here what we have is you've got a cable that's a legacy cable. We actually saw that cable. That cable is connected down below to the engine, right? And so it's a path to ground, and it would be, because remember, the engine is also connected to the common ground because the engine battery and the house battery are connected to the DC distribution common ground. That cable can be removed now that this cable is here, and that would give you one path to ground. So it's very essential as you add new paths to ground to remove the old paths to ground. The other thing too that you can see here is you actually have some, we're looking at the back of a source selector switch and we're looking at another fuse holder and notice this fuse holder how the fuse is actually, you can actually click on the sides here, right? And if you undo these Phillips you can actually screw that fuse all the way down. So but to fit that fuse all the way down you need to undo both of these slightly and then actually retighten them. So this fuse is not removable when both of these are actually tightened down. Um, so you've got a source selector. This actually uh, fuse holder and fuse is actually made to run this uh, small little inverter. And this cable over here is the ground that goes into this cable here and goes into this little portable small inverter. How do I choose what's the right breaker size? Well, first of all, a really common thing, if you're a do-it-yourself, which I would really recommend you get, is one of these clamp-on DC multimeters. Um, don't be, uh, I remember when I first got my boat years ago, and I was all excited, wanted to buy a tool, and then I ended up buying an AC model only. So make sure that if you buy one of these, you just don't go to Home Depot, because Home Depot is most likely going to just have an AC model. You want a DC AC model. And if you do that, you can actually clamp around a cable, and you could actually measure uh, the current going in and out of that cable. So if you've got a load and you're not sure what the load is, is my water pump drawing 2 amps or is it drawing 100 amps? Now I'm exaggerating, it's probably drawing 7 amps or 15 or, or maybe 5, it depends how it's running. Um, what you want to do is if you clamp on this around the cable, you can tell actually what the draw of the pump is. So you'd want to always make sure that that breaker is never going to cause nuisance stripping. Right? So you don't want to, if you're drawing four and a half amps, you don't want to have a five amp breaker. And the other thing too is as you're changing the breaker size, always make sure that the breaker is there to not just protect the appliance, but also protect the wire, the line in between the breaker and the appliance. So that line, for example, if you've got, I don't know, uh, you might be putting a water pump on board and you have a water pump and you're using a gauge 16 wire. Well, a gauge 16 wire is not going to be able to handle the loads of a water pump, right? Not a standard water pump. So you want to make sure that you always have at least the conductor between the appliance and the breaker that can handle the amperage that the breaker is going to give. So it's really about sizing, finding out what the load is with a clamp-on meter or simply reading the specs on the device if you can find them, and then making sure that the line feeding that appliance is actually the right size. And then you can size the breaker to only not only protect the line, but also protect the appliance. Is there a formula for the size of the breaker? Uh, no. Like twice if it's... No, I would say you probably want to do a ratio. Generally for nuisance stripping, I would say you probably want to do at least uh, maybe a 25%, you know, so you'd never get close. So if you've got, for example, a, a 10 amp breaker, you don't want to be running eight or nine amps out of that. Give yourself a little bit of room. Now, if you're getting specific, Really, these breakers are generally not to protect the appliance because you can't buy this breaker in 7 amps and 9 amps. Or These are really to protect the line. What you'll end up having is a fuse, and that fuse is going to be very specific for the manufacturer. It might say, I want a 10 amp fuse. I want an 8 AGC. I want a fast blow 2. So what you end up having is a breaker for the line to turn the appliance on and off and protect the line, and then you'll have a fuse right before the appliance that's going to protect the appliance. And that's going to be extremely specific, and it's actually going to be specified by the manufacturer of the product. And those fuses, can I, can I use those automotive spade fuses? Yeah, absolutely. I love those. And absolutely. use them with a waterproof? Well, it depends where it is. You don't have to have waterproof inside the boat. 
Um, I don't think so. There's no need. But yes, those ATO, ATCs, automotive uh, fuses, blade fuses are great. The problem with the glass fuse, well, is sometimes they shatter. But also reading the label of what is the size of a glass fuse in itself is a life challenge. I mean, it's extremely hard. Even for some of my guys that are in their 30s, I'm, I'm only 40, 41, and I have a, I'm squinting. And depending on the light, it's really hard. What's great about the ATO, ATCs is they're color coordinated. Some of them come with built-in LEDs, so if they burn out, they actually are showing the, the light, the fuse is actually going to have a small little LED telling you that it got burned out. Um, and it's pretty obvious what is a 2 amp, a 3 amp, a 5 amp, a 10 amp. It's all color coordinated. And they're easy to take in and out. So I certainly, given a choice, um, not that every time you want to use an ATO, ATC, but given a choice, I would probably, most of the time, I would end up choosing an ATO, ATC fuse.